Hello and welcome to New Books Network. I'm Pierre Lance. A few weeks ago, on a Sunday stroll in my London neighbourhood, I came across a large black billboard displaying the words To Colonise Everything in bold lettering. Next to the slogan was the artist designer's social media handle, which, I imagine, one could follow to understand the meaning of the proposal. Calls to decolonise a variety of disciplines, from literature and language to science and medicine, have gained a lot of attention of late. In the context of the 2020 racial reckoning in the US, the concept of decolonization has become the institution's public response to social pressures. Curricula, practices, knowledges and histories have all been subject to decolonization. An art school in London has a new institute for decolonizing the arts. There's even a punk music festival called Decolonize Fest. What could decolonization mean in all these contexts? In his new book, Against Decolonization, Olufemi Taiwo argues that the concept has lost its way and has become corrupted to such an extent that it supports the very opposite of its original aims. The drive to decolonize everything is not only unrealistic because it conflates modernity with coloniality, it's also deeply damaging because it disregards the agency of thinkers and societies that are subject to the process of decolonization. Olufemi Tawo is Professor of African Political Thought at Cornell University, and I'm very happy that he joins me now. Olufemi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Olufemi, I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, the book has piqued my interest already about eight months ago, way before it, it came, came out in print, partly for its provocative title, Against Decolonization, and even more for its reasonable subtitle of Taking African Agency Seriously, I want to start by asking you about how you arrived at this clash of ideas and how the project came to be. This was not a book I set out to write, <laughs> but I'm glad I wrote it. It started out as uh, a paper presentation at a conference on decolonizing philosophy. Mm. I committed to the conference a year ahead, uh, as I usually do to I just say yes to my friends, and then I realize how foolish that is later. <laughs> um, and then, you know, all that time for me, it was just, okay, we all talk about decolonizing, you know, so what's the big deal? So I go to the mm. conference and make my presentation. As I began to do the research, things began to change. Mm. And I started saying to myself, is this what people are really doing in this area? <laughs> and, you know, and I'm saying this as somebody who was a fan of Ngugi's Decolonizing the Mind, you know, mm-hmm. from the 80s when it came out. Uh, somebody who was part of the movement eventually that started at uh, University of Nairobi, you know, uh, that is one of the founding, you know, uh, texts of what is now called post-colonial literature, you know, mm-hmm. uh, criticism and which migrated to Nigeria when I was finishing my undergraduate studies. So I have a long history, you know, uh, with all this, Mm -hmm. Um, and the anti-colonial struggle, you know, uh, struggle for, you know, change in Africa and all that. But then as I was reading all this new stuff, that's when I started saying, this doesn't make sense. (laughs) But I couldn't pull out of the conference because I was, you know, but at the same time, I did not think that I was going to be a pleasant presence at the conference. Actually, mm-hmm. I said I was going to be a party pooper uh, because many people are going to be at the conference, friends, colleagues that I respect and who do the kind of work, you know, that mm-hmm. I ended up attacking. So I sort of came up with some another title. I just called it On Rethinking the Decolonizing Trope, uh, Decolonization Trope in Philosophy. Yeah. By the time I finished the presentation and the paper, uh, a friend of mine whom I acknowledge in the book called me up and said, I think there's a book here. So I said, don't even go there. <laughs> and from that conversation that night, the four chapters of the book emerged. And that's how the book was written. Well, I mean, this is already quite a good story. Where you, were, you were for a moment edging towards like a complete cancellation. You were going to be the black sheep of your discipline. But it turns out that that you've survived so far. I think before we go on, I have to, for myself, do a tiny bit of throat clearing. First of all, as as it's not going to be difficult for you or listeners to spot, I am not in any way, shape, or form an expert on decolonial discourses or even histories of the African continent in the context that we're talking about. But in contrast to maybe where you've ended up with a book, I have 
noticed the rise and rise, the unstoppable rise of the trope of decolonization as a term, as a culture in Western academia and, and also in culture. I work in art where, where the idea of decolonizing X, Y, and Z kind of comes up relentlessly. And I think I want to hand over to you straight away because I know that I've already committed within this description a couple of terminological slips. And I, I want to ask you to define a little bit what it is that decoloniality and decolonization mean in the sense that you are trying to address them. Okay. So let me talk about decoloniality. Okay. Um, I have refrained and I continue to refrain from having anything to say about decoloniality. Um, maybe when I grow up, I'll have a better sense of what they're talking about, and then I can <laughs> have something to say about it. But at the heart of it is the whole concept of coloniality. Mm -hmm. And my problem with that is that whatever qualifications people offer, when you move from colonialism to coloniality, and you're talking about a whole way of life, the whole way of looking at life, explaining phenomena and all that, and saying that they are all literally based in the ether of coloniality. I think for me, you have not just stepped out of, on a limb, you have practically fallen into an abyss because mm -hmm. that then means that what would something that is not subject to coloniality look like? What would be the counter instance? You know, how do we? go about falsifying, you know, that theory? How do we establish uh, where the theory is applicable and where it is not applicable? So that's the first part. The second part, and I said this in a, in a footnote in the book, is that for those who argue for coloniality, which came straight out of Latin America, you know, mm. uh, they have a longer history <laughs> with colonialism yeah. than Africa does. That's the first part. Mm -hmm. The second part is something that I will now say, you know, and I think I said it in the book, maybe I did not say it so brutally, is that this is a family quarrel <laughs> between the mestizo class that dominates in South America and Central America and the European fathers who abandoned them. Mm. Okay? Uh, because when I look, though things are beginning to change, I do not find the native peoples that people are using to mm -hmm. argue, you know, for the continuing, you know, for the permanence of coloniality and all that, being any significant presences, you know, being references for the apostles of coloniality and all that, and their works being used as the primary authorities, you know, for understanding reality. Yeah. I'm not even sure how many of the decolonial theories have ever bothered to learn the original languages to become scholars, you know, of the culture mm. and so on. So for me, you can trot native peoples out as kind of, you know, props, you know, for your, yeah. but I do not see any kind of serious investment, you know, uh, in that. Now, when you now come to Africa, of course, as somebody who has always argued against what I call the metaphysics of difference, mm. whereby people define Africa by absolute alterity, you know, yeah. uh, I might be falling into my own trap by talking about Africa being different, you know, <laughs> in this case. Uh, but that's not what I have in mind. Uh, if we take history very seriously, the first thing we want to see is how strong, how central, how significant was colonialism in the constitution of Africa mm -hmm. as we know it today. And my answer is, as the historian, the Nigerian historian, you know, pointed out in a paper written, you know, 1969, it's either you take colonialism as just an episode in African history, or you take mm -hmm. African history as being defined essentially by colonialism. So when people use what I call a bastard periodization in the book, colonialism as the singular pole of periodizing mm -hmm. African history, I think that is absolutely unacceptable. Because there is no part of Africa, let me put it again, there is no part of Africa where colonialism, and we're talking here now of European, mm -hmm. modern European colonialism, those qualifications are very, very important. Yeah. Okay? 
no part of Africa where modern European colonialism lasted for up to much less more than 100 years. Mm. No part. And I hope that historians will come out to challenge that claim, you know, and show that I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and if that is the case, then we have to ask the question, how brittle were African societies mm. and civilizations and cultures that something that was there for just 100 years practically turned their world upside down in such a way that we can no longer talk about anything there without mm. some reference direct or indirect to colonialism. That doesn't make sense, and I don't think it can be supported by the materials available. That's my point. That, that's a very strong formulation. I'm pretty sure that you've encountered proponents of mainstream decolonial discourse um, that as short as this hundred years has been, it has been brutal in completely rewriting the lots and the futures of African societies. But I think I think we, we have to go with you a little bit and, and to go through some examples and figure out why the language really matters and why that kind of thinking, as you already alluded to, is a little bit defeated. So I think one of the things you do early on, and it almost has to be drawn kind of in, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on a flip chart with, with one circle versus another circle, you make a distinction between two types of decolonization. One of them has number one, the other one has number two, simply to draw a distinction between the different phases of the decolonial project that starts with the achievement of autonomy, the gaining of independence by successive societies and states in Africa, and the second one, decolonization two, goes on to essentially run against windmills as you, as you, as you end up seeing it. So it con continues to go on with the process of decolonization long past independence. So I want to, I want to ask you to, to talk a little bit about how you see the concepts of decolonization and the aims of decolonization that start in your estimation with perfectly well-formed a consistent project from, from things like Franz Fanon, but end up in this kind of inconsistent mess that you had just, just outlined. How is it that we've got to the point where decolonization means something different than it, than it started, and, and why is that a problem? Okay, the two senses of decolonization that I identified uh, have to do with the original idea of decolonization was about the struggle for independence all over the world, yeah. not just in Africa. Again, people forget that colonialism was not something that happened to Africa alone. Mm. Vietnam, South Korea, you know, China, mm -hmm. uh, Malaysia, uh, Greece, people forget. Uh, and I like to remind them. So all across Europe, you know, and that's the reason why I said modern European colonialism. Because, again, part of the tragedy is that people think that colonialism was something that was introduced to Africa by Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there was Byzantine colonialism in North Africa. There was mm -hmm. Roman colonialism in North Africa. There was Arab colonialism in North Africa. They were all different kinds of colonialism. Yeah. So we now have to distinguish between different kinds of colonialism depending on the era that we're looking at. And the colonialism we are looking at was the colonialism that came with the modern age, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason why it becomes very important to be very specific is that modern colonialism came with a contradiction right at its heart. Yeah. Because the modern age is also the age in which, you know, a government is not legitimate if it has not been consented to mm -hmm. by the governed. And when colonialism deigns to rule a people without their consent, by definition, it is illegitimate. Mm. And that is something that is applicable in the modern age. Yeah. And we should also not forget various kinds of colonialism that were in Africa before Europe got there. Mm. Okay? Um, different peoples colonized other peoples within the continent. The people that I belong to, you know, had an empire called Oyo. It was a multilingual, multi-ethnic, multinational empire that stretched from the area of present-day Western Nigeria all the way to the borders of modern-day Ghana. Yeah. And people who lived under that control were actually colonies. They were 
And this is a great part of the problem of language. People come to Africa and say, oh, they were vassal states. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody is determining how you are ruled, who you are ruled by, and they set standards of what you need to do in order to remain, you know, without being liquidated and all that. Hello? You know? Um, and in some of the cases, you actually have linguistic colonialism, you know, in all those yeah. also come to Nigeria, in all those border areas, you know, where Yoruba people loaded it over other people. And people will tell you, I don't speak Yoruba because I want to, but because, you know, it was imposed on me. Yeah. So we do need to take all these distinctions very seriously. So my point is that the original mission of decolonization was to free all those countries so that they can come back, as Cabra put it, to be history makers on their own again, which again is a modern thing mm -hmm. that, you know, subjects should be the authors of their own life scripts. And colonization ended that, pushed people away from autochthonous history making, you know, made them into, you know, subordinates, and their history became an element of the history of their colonizers. And I'm saying that that was a very clear thing, you know, the country will become independent, will have its own... In fact, what people want to dismiss, deride as flag independence is the best icon, you know, of that first mm -hmm. idea of decolonization. Okay. Now, what happened was that after independence, because what people consider to be the ultimate goal of independence, which is, you know, self-sustaining societies under the control of their own, you know, rulers, not, you know, and so on and so forth, has not happened. Mm -hmm. People then interpreted that as, oh, well, you know, France is still dominating countries in Africa, you know, uh, Britain is still dominating countries in Africa. Therefore, there was no decolonization. So, and not only that, they then expanded it into how we explain phenomena, such that any ex-colony whose inhabitants, intellectuals, you know, journalists, all of them, find anything worthwhile in the lives or modes of you know being of their erstwhile colonizers and decide to keep those continue to be evidence of colonial mentality mm -hmm. that's when i said wait a minute you cannot say because something happened under colonialism i will now find it again in the post independence period Therefore, colonialism is the explanation for its persistence in the post-independence period. Philosophically, that doesn't make any sense yeah. because we could have any number of reasons why this has persisted. Inertia may be one. Mm. Okay? Yeah. It may be the choice of the people to say, you know what? You have this thing. We, we saw it, you know. We really like it and we're going to make it our own. Mm. Now, why do you want to say that for any oppressed group to find anything in the mode of being of their oppressor outside of the oppressive instruments is a continuation of their oppression. That's what I mean by when you do that, you have practically trashed native agency. Yeah, I mean, that's super clear to me. And, and, and frankly, reading your book, I was time and time perplexed as to why, much why the understanding of the problems as you outline them has not permeated certainly Western academia, with its propensity to, to, to continue exactly the conversation about the uh, decolonization, as, as you have just outlined. But I, th I think to, to maybe make that clearer, I want to ask you a little bit about the values of this ongoing problematic, oh, terrible word, this ongoing vain project of decolonization, the, the second part of decolonization, and what values you see driving that conviction and where, what values you set up for your opposition to, to the project of ongoing decolonization? Because I think the question of modernity, which comes up in the book time and time again, is super important. And you, you do take a particular, particular side. You, you're definitely a proponent of the Enlightenment project. That already makes you a little bit unpopular in 2022, frankly, on, on any continent. How do, how do we pin readings of values and how, how do we infuse this theoretical project, both, both the one you're critiquing and yours? Let me put it this way. I don't think that the 
quote unquote, enlightenment project is as unpopular as people think it is. <laughs> it is unpopular among intellectuals mm. who think that there's something sexy, you know, about identity and who, again, do everything they can literally to award victory to Europe and America that neither has deserved nor earned. <laughs> okay? That's harsh. Um, so where you find right-wing people in Europe and America claiming that other peoples have not contributed anything to civilization, especially Africa, okay? And they then say, where's your Kant, you know, where's your whatever, uh, and all that. And then people here, uh, people in Africa and people here who consider themselves their allies, then say, oh, yeah, you know, we didn't have that, you know, uh, so you are right, you know, you do own the enlightenment. No people own any ideas. Hello? <laughs> no people own any ideas. Two, ideas do not follow geographical boundaries. Mm -hmm. And as ideas circulate and people come in contact with them, to the extent that they are willing to put in the sweat equity to make those ideas their own, they become co-owners of the ideas. Mm. So when you talk of the Enlightenment, for instance, okay, think of chattel slavery in the United yeah. States. Now, who exactly is a better singer of freedom song? Is it Jefferson who owns slaves? Or the enslaved who told Jefferson, you've been dishonest. We are men too. Hmm. And we are covered already by what you happened upon, but don't have the courage to make real for everybody. So stop lying to yourself. We cut you out. And when they do that, they become co-writers of Freedom Song. Yeah. And when you now say that, oh, freedom is a Western thing, that's what I mean by donating victory to people who have not earned it. Hmm. When you now say that, you know, liberal representative democracy is a Western thing, then you have to explain what the heck happened in Germany, what the mm. heck happened in France, you know, including as recently as 58 and Charles de Gaulle, you know, uh, what the heck happened in Greece, you know, with coup d'etat, you know, it's supposed to be the origin of, you know, Western civilization. Mm. So how then do you set all those examples apart? And then say that, oh, yeah, when coups happen in Nigeria, you know, and all that, that just shows that liberal representative democracy is incompatible with their culture. Hmm. How much sense does that make? Yeah, that's a, that's a question that we, we might want to consider as I ask you to, to, to try to mount your case against the trope of going back to maybe nativist and originalist and very geographically bound ideas from, from philosophy. So you, you tackle maybe three areas explicitly in your book. You talk about philosophy, your own discipline. You talk about language and literature. Yeah. And, and you address broader, broader culture. And, and the argument, I think, is kind of similar in all of them, which is yes. essentially what, you, what you've just outlined. It is essentially preposterous to, to try to claim that ideas do not travel geographically. It is preposterous to claim that um, even colonized populations do not participate to some extent in intellectual life and that mixing does not result in kind of a paradigm shift. There was a little bit I was reading this, you talk about hybridity, and of course I was, I was reminded of the kind of quick dismissals of Homi Baba's arguments about, um, about the mixing of cultures of the colonized and the colonizer and how difficult that already, that his, his writing is to swallow. You know, for, for God forbid, should it suggest that there's something, not even positive, but of historical significance that we won't just might want to run with in the experience of being colonized. Yeah. And maybe it's important to also stress, even though it should be obvious that you are in no way in the book an apologist for any of the um, horrific aspects of colonial oppression and, and also post you're definitely not, not a fan of many of the post-colonial conditions on, on the African continent. Let's look at some detail on some of the ideas proposed by thinkers like Fazi Viredu, who you correspond with in the book quite heavily, and the way you really argue against the idea of adopting strictly African concepts and this kind of idea that, that if, we, if we only could go back 200, 300 years, 
we'll be able to reconstruct African philosophy that is somehow perfectly well formed to deal with African questions and problems and would be completely free from this strange influence of concepts like rationality and freedom and so on and so on. So why, why is it not, not useful in an African context to, to stick to African, African concepts? Uh, that's assuming there is such a beast called African concept. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly pinching myself as I'm saying this, but, yeah. but, so but, but what, go, go, go with it. Yeah. No, no. Um, it doesn't make any sense. What do African concepts look like? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of other work mm -hmm. that I have done, you know, um, that addresses this. Everybody talks about African traditional religion. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a paper several years ago where I said that concept does not make any sense. Mm. Why? A religion is a religion is a religion. So if you find an empirical analog of what we refer to by the concept of religion in Africa, what you can say is it's an African religion. Mm. And if you want to talk about, you know, autochthonous, you know, African religions, then you find their roots right there. Um, but you can also have indigenous African religions that are not original to the place, but have become indigenized over time. Christianity and Islam would be very good examples, you know. Mm -hmm. of those. Um, so when people then talk about, you know, African traditional religion, they are looking for some kind of African concept. And what they end up doing is a mishmash of different traditions and cultures across the continent. And then I tell people, I said, I'm sorry, Yoruba religion is unlike other religious traditions that I know. So if you are not going to panabit all of them into some kind of dubious uniformity, in fact, Yoruba religion is more like Greek religion. Hmm. <laughs> Do you know how much those two are, are like? without any evidence of their having touched one another over time. If you took out all the Greeks and God, gods and goddesses and you substituted Yoruba gods and goddesses, you don't need to change anything. <laughs> they got divination, they got ecstasy, they got possession. And in both religions, if a god is not offering what you are looking for, you trade them in for new gods. Mm -hmm. So when did you then allow yourself to be goaded into thinking that the Abrahamic religions dominated by monotheism, which are the anomalies in the history of religions in the world, and they continue to be the anomalies, you know, then become your standard. And you then try to find a way to say that, oh, you know, African traditional religion is like Christianity. We also have one supreme God. Where's that coming from? I mean, you, you, you almost make it sound like there's a case for, for actually thinking about the Enlightenment and the universalism that it brought. So, you know, your, your historical example that predates um, European colonialism is bizarrely Enlightenment in its, in, in its, in its form. But let's, let's, maybe, let's maybe still man the argument of the proponents of the continued need for decolonization because, because it's, a, you know, it's a project that's clearly attractive to thinkers all over the world and, and ideas of decolonizations have been applied in both detail and in general terms time and time again. So, but, but ignoring this kind of, kind of free for all, what is it that you see um, the thinkers who you critique are trying to achieve with the, with the ideas of decolonizing, well, we were talking about African philosophy. What would be the possible best outcome in their view of having decolonized African thought? Uh, honestly, as I said in the book, I do not see any redeeming dimension to the decolonization discourse, period. Okay, well, that's, that's going to be a short conversation. What, what do they say? <laughs> um, because when you, when you say that we should decolonize African philosophy, okay, one, you need to show me that the African philosophy you are decolonizing is a product of colonialism, mm. okay? Or two, has continued to be dominated by colonialism. But if what I said that the colonization already happened, bye-bye, you know, is plausible, don't let's even say that it's correct, it's plausible, mm. then how do you decolonize where there's no colonialism? <laughs> My argument is that what is going on post-independence in Africa 
may, in some respects, be explained by colonialism. But for the most part, after independence, you need to take African agencies seriously mm -hmm. and either say that, well, these are, you know, omissions or commissions on the part of Africans that we need to explain why they keep making those choices. But to continue to treat Africa as if it were the playthings of, you know, superpowers, I think it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I want I want to stick a little bit with this. I'm going I'm going to, to push you because there's a risk in in your concept the way we are talking against the colonization, this kind of facile understanding of of Africa's legacies of colonialism still being the you know the, the elephant in the room. I think there's a risk in simply kind of dirtying a word. If decolonization, you claim, you argue, if if that as a term has stopped being useful. How is that in itself critique of the attempts to, naive attempts, I, I would agree, to, to roll back a little bit of time? And you, you, you do address nativism and, and atavism in, in, in the book quite explicitly. And that, I think, has a sort of interesting ring to some of the things that are happening in Western circles, not even to do with, with Africa and post-colonialism in a sense. It's just that we see, as our politics gets more and more tumultuous, we see conservative attempts to roll back time, to go back into some yeah. kind of imagined past. You know, I was, I was reading aspects of your accounts of African writers trying to argue for the return to African languages and yes. rejecting languages of the colonizer, whether it's French or yes. Portuguese or English. And I was sort of thinking about right American right-wing memes in which we have US Americans trying to invoke ideas of the Roman Republic. And yes saying things like return and spelling yes. it with a V as opposed to U to make themselves sound a little bit more you know, Roman Italian in a sense. And I think there was a confusion there that it's terminological and I'm completely with you in as much as it makes no sense to conflate armed occupation and resource extraction quite often under the point of a gun and a cultural process. This is definitely not a good way to do politics. But I think I'd, li I'd like you to try to address maybe the, the cultural aspect a little bit more that goes beyond the terminological. Yeah, again, this is uh, part of what bothers me about the decolonization discourse. And that is that once people buy into what Fanon called the make-believe world of colonialism, mm. whereby you know, you have colonizers on one side, you have colonized on the other side, and near the train shall meet, okay? Mm. Uh, then what you end up with will be, you know, cardboard copies of real mm. human beings and groups. Now, as I said in the book, Afano made that very clear. Yeah. The lives of the colonized and the colonizer were not separable. Mm. Just like in the case of chattel slavery, and as I said in the book, the slave owners actually believed that the enslaved were animals. Then this was a civilization built on bestiality. Mm. So those of us who are then analysts, theorists, thinkers, it is our duty to not accept the stories that the oppressors tell about themselves. <laughs> and what that means is that I shift focus away from what British colonizers were thought they were doing in Nigeria. And then I asked, how did the colonized view what was going on? How did the mm -hmm. enslaved view their city? The enslaved never believed at any moment that they were not human. Mm. So they continued to exercise the prerogative of being human, including divesting their so-called owners of their language. Mm. And then they turn that language to use. So what do you want African-Americans to do to decolonize language? So they must give up on the English language? Hmm. That was the language of the slave owners. And when you now come to Africa, you know, as I said in the book, English was not introduced to Africa by colonialism. That's the first part. The second part is it's not just English. When you look at all the coasts in West Africa, and all those forts that were built for slavery and for the slave trade and so on and so forth, those forts and the communities around them, they were all cosmopolitan co communities where people spoke several languages. 
where people interacted with one another. So you want any African language in that neighborhood that's going to pretend to some kind of pristineness mm. after 500 years of those bleedings into one another? So when you are now saying that we should go back to an African language, that's why I said, you make it seem as if it's so easy for us to say, oh, here is an African language. Do you have any living language that is not creolized? Welcome mm. to English. And as I like to joke with my students, you know, I hope Indians wake up one day and say to the English, we want my uh, Kaliko back, you know, we want all those <laughs> that you have now incorporated into. So <laughs> why is it okay for the English to make their own, whatever they find anywhere, and it's not okay for the Yoruba to do exactly the same thing? Well, there's no good answer to that. But you do run a good critique of the promises of the own language discourse. And you take issue with um, Gogi Wathyongo, who, who's one of the theories of adoption of African or re-adoption of African languages. And maybe rather than run through the argument again, I might ask you about your experience of, of writing in English. And, and forgive me if I'm going to exoticize you a little bit, but I, I would like to, to think a little bit about your position in forming this argument as someone who has been active in academia both in Nigeria and now in the US. So there's this kind of duality which you point to in a book time and time again in the experience of anyone who grows up speaking more than one language or frankly one you know growing up with one language is already legitimate enough for, <laughs> under any circumstances. But I want to I want to think a little bit about how your experience of making these arguments from both inside and outside, how that might have shaped, shaped the argument itself and your position? Uh, you know, as much as possible, actually, I did not exactly start from where I am sitting personally. I mean, I told mm. that story uh, just to show that, look, I understand what the issues are uh, with people mm. uh, who find that. And this is why it gets biographical. My education in Nigeria did not exclude Yoruba, mm. in fact, it was part of my education. And this is again the part that people miss when they panel beat Africa into one, you know, flat, whatever, you know, uh, picture they want to paint. Uh, in fact, there is more now that it's been done by people I consider airheads, you know, who think that their children will not do well if they speak their original languages and all that. When I was growing up, that was not an issue. Yes, we were punished in school uh, so that we'll get the proper diction for English and so on and so on. We were discouraged from using, you know, our Yoruba language. But we were studying Yoruba, you know, as a subject. <laughs> we were reading Yoruba literature, you know. So for my generation who paid attention and all that, if you wish to, you could be effectively bilingual as I am. Mm. And you look at somebody like Wale Shoyinka, who did not even have the benefit of, I think, studying Yoruba, you know, uh, during the colonial period and so on and so forth. But his Yoruba continues to inflect his writing in English. And that's why I said in the book, you are not going to mistake Wale Shoyinka for Harold Pinter. <laughs> they both write in English. But mm. Harold Pinter does not write Shoyinka English. Yeah. And Shoyinka does not write Harold Pinter English. That says something about whether or not it's possible for anyone to domesticate a language and literally put their spin on it. Indian mm. English, Australian you know, yeah. English, Canadian English. So this is the kind of complexity that people elide when they now talk about you know, how uh, and how does a language become colonial? Mm. A language that has freedom in it, a language that says it's unacceptable for one group to lord it over another without the other group's consent. That's a language that lends itself to those over whom it's been lorded to say, hey, wait a minute, we found this. What you're doing is wrong. <laughs> so justify yourself to us. At that point, can the ruler continue to say that, oh, by the way, give me my English back because that's not your language? Mm -hmm. No. So people claim it and then use it to fight those who use it to justify their... Op so all those who might want to read my book as there's something positive about colonialism. Heck no. There's nothing positive mm -hmm. about it. I already wrote that in a previous book. But 
some of those artifacts are not owned by colonialism. Mm. In fact, colonialism, in presuming to own them, showed its own bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah, that that is definitely a logical logical misstep. But if I if I wanted to pay some attention to to the argument of the proponents of ongoing decoloniality, they would probably argue that there are aspects of language that, of colonial languages, as they would term them, that simply that simply make it impossible to discuss certain issues. I mean that we we see we see this we see this constantly within within the West, for instance. Like you know, we must invent new languages to be able to critique capitalism. We must invent new language so that neo-colonialism, which apparently a bit like neoliberalism and capitalism, are you know these kind of blanket terms. But I'm sort of laughing at this because I want to ask you for your proposal for extending or rather building critiques from the perspective of agency of the current condition that, of course, is not uniform, but, but more or less has the African continent in its grip. And that, that in one point in the book, you concede that it might be neocoloniality, which I think might be worth stressing is not the, exactly the same, the same thing as, as legacies of colonialism, because for one, it's different states that seem to have you know, different oppressors, if we were going to call them oppressors, are active on the continent. Definitely not, not as though as the British Empire and, and the Belgians continue to ex- exploit X or Y. But I think my, my broader question is to, is to do with how we move from the slightly bankrupt and ineffective project of decolonization into a productive version of it. Because I think we, it would be, would be so, so tempting to, to go with you and say, oh, we must, we must move on. All of these discourses are completely irrelevant. But unfortunately, the reality of neocolonialism and under its various guises, which don't always even need to have the colonial aspect to them, but there, there must be a relationship. Or are you, are you proposing the relationship is now so far removed that we, we need to operate under a completely different terminology? Remember in the book, I revisited the idea of neocolonialism. Mm-hmm. And I quoted, I actually revised the idea of neocolonialism presented by Kwame Nkrumah, mm-hmm. and I now introduced into the discourse a Nigerian thinker, Obafemi Awolowo, who said neocolonialism is what we do to ourselves as Africans who have failed to use the opportunity given us by independence to reorder mm-hmm. our own priorities. Now, it's out there now, so let the colonizers respond to it. Uh, I think neocolonialism is a red herring. It really doesn't make any sense because I joke now that in 50 years, our intellectual grandchildren will be pushing the decolonizing whatever against China. <laughs> I thought, yep, QED. I think that, that's all we need to know about the concept. Oh, so, so is that, you know, Britain and France and all of them right now, they are not the ones messing with Africa. It's China. Mm. And your intellectuals are busy in the name of some so-called anti-Westernism, saying that China is our friend. Mm. And China is now building party schools in Tanzania and Uganda on how to run one party states. In 50 years, and literally, they are the ones who are now completely logging into extinction. Africa's forests, you know, the redwoods in Gambia and Senegal, (laughs) the Mm. rainforest in Liberia, in less than 20 years. That's again part of what I mean by why b- people are busy chasing you know, slides, because this whole scholarship for me is a scholarship dedicated to chasing slides. Mm-hmm. The real issues, you know, even the business of writing original stuff in African philosophy is not going on. Mm. That's okay. what I mean by it is inimical to the growth of scholarship you know, in the continent. Everywhere you turn now, your young people, because that's where the money is, they want to decolonize. Mm. And all the people that are entered into the debate in this book, you cannot find African scholars who are experts on them. Mm. I, w- I want to situate this a little bit geographically. What you describe is, it seems like like quite terrible impasse. You call in the book for writing more complex, more hard-hitting histories and theories and, and philosophies. And there's even an aspect of the book in which I, I see 
your dissatisfaction with a lot of African statecraft, like literally politics, right? You're looking for permission almost to call your leaders, call your politicians Thank ineffectual. You. And, and, and I think that's incredibly important. But to kind of try to see how this impasse is built and where it is, this kind of cloud chasing that you have just described happens. I wonder if you could offer a perspective on the differences between the cult of decolonization within African thought and within the West. So I think I've made it quite clear that I, you know, within my Western experience, yes. I'm baffled that we get to still talk in the way we do. You know, my university where I'm pursuing a PhD has now had its administrators roll out a whole program of decolonization. I mean, I don't know why a university in Birmingham needs to have lectures on this, where, you know, why, why sociologists and musicians need to be taught by some consultants about decolonization. So I think the question I want to get out of this is, in which direction do you think this concept, the bankrupt concept, travels? And what is it that African thought, African politics, has been doing to resist it? Or, or what alternatives does it, does it propose? You know, in an ideal world, if the West could just go and you know, leave, leave Africa alone for five minutes so it could do its own thing, whatever shape that takes. Let me, let me say this. And there's a reason why throughout the book, I did not single out particular decolonizers, you know, to mm -hmm. argue. I am perfectly happy to leave people to their own designs, yeah. uh, enter this into the conversation and have our audience decide what serves them best. That's the first part. The second part is, you know, when people in the so-called West <laughs> begin to run around with this decolonizing, whatever it is and all that. The mm -hmm. first question I ask them is, where are the authorities from Africa that you are reading and teaching to your students? Mm. Where are the thinkers that you consider worth your while that you are going back to school to study mm -hmm. so that you can expand your own repertoire you know, of materials? So what you end up with is a kind of tokenization, but more importantly, a kind of self-flagellation, you know, that just says, oh, beat me up a little bit more, you know, I'm really accounting for what my people did to you. And which again, for me, as I tell people here in the United States, if as a white person, you need to gape, uh, to gawk at my pain to know that there's something wrong with anti-black racism, you got a problem. <laughs> Well, that is crushing. Okay? When you, you know, begin all this, oh, we must decolonize and all that, and then I ask you, how many African intellectuals do you consider to be worthy of your professional attention to read and argue with them so that you can show your students multiple ways of being human? Mm. Zero. So, yes, it makes for good copy, for those, you know, who just want to appear to be doing something. Uh, two years ago, it got me to the point where I wrote an op-ed for the student paper here that I called, don't stand with me, stand in your lane and do the right thing. Mm. And doing the right thing means that you take African agencies seriously and you don't, you don't turn Africa into a continent of pathologies where the only thing you are interested in is in going there to dig latrines to serve your conscience. Mm. So please take Africa as an intellectual project. And don't just read those in your echo chamber, you know, where you are all just going on about colonialism. Please start taking very seriously the 1,000 plus years of Yoruba history and culture. Mm. Please go out and learn African languages and not write all this BS about how Oh, there's something in Akan, it's very similar to this in Luganda. How much of those languages do you know for you to even know that any word is similar to any word in the other language? How do you do comparison when you don't have two pieces? <laughs> no, so that's what I mean by, but meanwhile, you find many African scholars for whom this is lucrative, and I'm yeah. afraid they are making exactly the same bargains that our forebears made when we sold all human beings for half-drunk bottles of scotch. Hmm. That is an indictment, Femi. That so is... you must go and read the work that an idiot like me does. I don't go around chasing anybody. 
I try to put concrete food on the table. Mm-hmm. I've just published a pamphlet on chieftaincy where people are shocked when I talk about chieftaincy as a global phenomenon. I mean, your chief just passed in the United Kingdom. Mm. But because of colonialism and there could only be one king in the empire, so all African kings were reduced to chiefs. And then African scholars begin to pretend that chiefs are part of the DNA of Africa and not a global phenomenon. Mm. And then your philosophers are then talking about traditional you know, political systems. What the heck are those? They never changed in 1,000 years? They did not evolve? They did not borrow from anywhere? Mm. If that's what people want to call scholarship, I wish them well. But that's not my deal. Look, I want to push on this a little bit, because on the success of this proposal, a lot rights. You know, like whether, whether your assault on, on this blindness has been worth it really will be determined on whether it inspires a little bit scholars, frankly, anywhere in the world to, to work a little bit harder. And, and I completely echo your call to do history, to do philosophy in its context, with due attention to the uncomfortable outcomes. And, and I, of course, completely see the kind of Manichaean turn to, to make the African continent oppressed and the white man bad is really serving absolutely no one. But I think, I think I'm interested also in the end on, on some kind of epistemic approach that allows us to really see where the investment in thought and in research and in scholarship would be most productive in overcoming those limitations. I mean, earlier on, we maybe could have talked a little bit about kind of epistemic, epistemic conversation. You know, you, you introduced me to a new term, which, which frankly would be super useful in my own research of epistemicide, this idea that colonialism went and brought all sorts of indigenous knowledges into the ground and all sorts of knowledges lost, which of course is difficult to argue against on one side, but the undoing of it, as we are seeing now, is equally destructive. You know, I see one after another university department in the West being, being started with the idea of the way I see it, of just capturing indigenous knowledges and locking them away in Western universities. So, so I'm kind of going to repeat, repeat the question a little bit. Where does this heavy task that you are, you are, you are pointing us to, to lie? Who is well positioned you know, to, 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 take, to take a step away from decolonization and to, God, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm already frustrated by, by, by the language, you know, but the, if we were to do the work to, to repeat this tiresome term, where uh, is that work best done? Uh, let me put it this way. Institutions have been taken over by the decolonization hordes, uh, but people like me, my work is with my students. Mm-hmm undergraduate and graduate, and whoever else is willing to uh, get on the path of doing substantive work rather than going around excoriating people. Um, I have a student right now, and I am absolutely proud to, you know, talk about his work everywhere. People always think that, you know, uh, now, quote unquote, modern science came with colonialism to Africa. He's writing a dissertation where he's showing that, yes, mm. people have been talking about modern science in Africa before colonialism, and not just in, quote-unquote, sub-Saharan Africa. Again, another one of those you know, crazy uh, typologies that people embrace, which are completely meaningless uh, when you think about it. So it's actually comparing two thinkers, one from Sierra Leone, one from Egypt, both working mm-hmm. in the early to mid-19th century talking about modern science. Those are the kinds of work that um, uh, I am interested in. If somebody wants to work on the philosophical foundations of indigenous modes of governance, you've got to be very specific. And if you're going to be comparing, you've got to show me that you are as you know, well read in, one, in, in the two areas that you want to be comparing. Uh, so mm-hmm. this business of homogenizing Africa, you know, and jumping in one sentence from Accra to uh, Nairobi and then to South Africa because all Africans are the same. That for me is not scholarship. I'm sorry. Um, mm. If people are doing it, I wish them well. So what I'm saying essentially is uh, this will be the work of individuals and some of us who get into groups uh, where we are actually pushing these boundaries and trying to put out the kind of work that we think should reflect this. Uh, and I'm not going to begrudge uh, the good fortune of those who do it otherwise. As I said, our audience is out there 
and the audience will decide who serves them. That's really uh, my point. Well, so, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to point out that you you do actually engage with named thinkers and named writings in the book. So, yeah. so, oh, so no, what I mean by that by, is by that. way of recommendation, it's not just a yeah, kind of empty you. argument that we that we, we are doing. Thank it's you. Not so, just a, uh, all these uh, schools in the UK, in the United States, and so on and so forth. I don't have anything to say to people. I'm not going to be part of those discussions. I'm never part of mm. those conversations. And as I'd love to tell my friends, I wish them well. Uh, mm. But if a young person who wants to go to graduate school and all that, and then they approach me, and then once they tell me, well, I want to decolonize, I, I tell them, I don't think I'm your teacher. Mm. I do that routinely now. Anybody who wants to do decolonizing, I cannot sign on to, to train them. <laughs> well, that's certainly fair enough, but I think we need to do justice to the book and let you end our conversation with a success story or two. When I said that it's only among, quote-unquote, intellectuals that the Enlightenment Project is not popular, uh, mm. everywhere in the world right now, you find, and that's why I mentioned those examples, especially in the final chapter of the book. Mm -hmm. In Thailand, you know, young people are on the way to getting rid of the monarchy or getting it to yeah. become constitutional based on exactly the same precepts that people want to dismiss as, you know, colonialism inflicted, yeah. enlightenment, whatever. They, they said to the king, you don't own this place, we do. Mm. Okay? And we want to be able to pick our own government, not you. Those are all elements of the modern age. Yeah. The kids in Hong Kong, those are the most relevant to us because all those rights that people in Hong Kong are now dying to protect were not there while colonialism lasted. And then on the eve of Hong Kong being handed back to China, just as Britain did in all its colonies in Africa, yeah. they gave them a constitution with Bill of Rights. <laughs> <laughs> and the people in Hong Kong have only had so many years and they said, guess what? We love this. And China says yeah. you cannot have that. And they are dying to protect those things. If this is so colonial, so why do people in Hong Kong want to die to protect them? That is the evidence you need that these are human inheritances. Mm. They are not owned by any people. And if a people consider that this will give us a life that is better than the one we were previously under, we're going to die for them. Yeah. And you find that going on now all across Africa, everybody is trying to put what I call the empirical version of the modern state, a state that answers to its people. Governments that are chattered, you know, by the citizens. Mm. And a respect for the inviolate dignity of every human, regardless yeah. of race, class, ethnicity, nation, religion. Those are universal categories, you know. So my point is that the decolonization trope cannot even allow people to see all these parallels across the world because Africa has been put in a box of difference yeah. and we have to oppose colonialism. Yeah, it's a paradox. I mean, one of the things you, you bring up in a book just in passing is the economic success of Korea, for instance. And of course, Korea's economic success is pretty directly linked to its, to, to its colonization. Maybe I can ask you to address a little bit your reflection um, on your learnings from the Caribbean. So you very optimistically, you yes. end the book with a reflection of, of you know, being black and modern in, yes. in the Caribbean. Yes. Again, you know, we're comparing apples to, to oranges in, in many ways, you know, Africa and the Caribbean are not the same place, but, but oh, you have no. something to look what forward to. I'm comparing apples to oranges. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I mean, I'm going well, in, I'm going in the, the, the exactly. diversity. You, you, that's again part of the theme, because every time mm. we talk, people then say, oh, well, that's Western. And then as I was finishing the book, I said, come to think of it, look at the West Indies. Colonialism. They are predominantly black. Many of them take seriously their African origins and have preserved all kinds of African cultural elements and all that. But they've never operated in any other currency except that of modernity. And that, mm -hmm. for me, was where the departure from Africa becomes very, very glaring. Yeah. And what that tells you is that any people can lay hold of this and work it to their own advantage if they become very good students of it. And that then actually put
pulls the rug from under the feet of a lot of political science talk about Africa, which is always about, you know, the low development of political culture, the, you know, uh, uh, indigenous, whatever. So I said, thank goodness. Our causes in the Caribbean never had any chieftaincy to deal with. <laughs> and they did not have colonial authorities who said, we have to keep your chiefs. And so, in fact, many Nigerians, many Africans now escape to those places to have the guarantee of a better quality of life. Mm. Exactly why many Africans now escape to South Africa to enjoy more control over their lives. Well, Femi, lots of work to be done by, by all of us. For me, your book is about as convincing as, as an argument needs to be in, in this particular field, and I really recommend it. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining Thank me. Thank you very much. It's been nice Thank talking you. with you, Pierre. Thank you so much. Against the Colonization, Taking African Agency Seriously by Olufemi Tewa is published by Hearst. I'm Pierre Valencia, and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thanks for listening, and join us next time.